Hi, everyone. So glad you could make it this morning. I'm Tony Pace Carstensen. I am chair of the VES Vision Committee. And on behalf of the VES Vision Committee and the Education Committee, I'd like to welcome everyone here. Netflix, YouTube, Amazon, film festivals, content distribution channels are multiplying at a staggering pace. But who is going to fill those distribution channels? You. Why? Because you are the only person who can express your own personal vision in your own voice. Our speakers today are creative directors who will be sharing their vision with you in terms of film and animation. But first, I would like to thank the USC School of Cinematic Arts, Film and Television Production Division for hosting our event today. Everyone on the team has been incredibly helpful and we're very, very grateful. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator. Michael Fink is an Academy Award winning visual effects supervisor. He is also chair of the USC School of Cinematic Arts, Film and Television Production Division. Please join me in welcoming Michael Fink. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you, sir. Hi. Uh, welcome to, e whoa, I always forget about that. There's this little, yeah. It gets me every time. I've been here for five years, and I still <laughs> um, I just want to welcome you to SC. It's the first time we've done this here. And of course, we didn't plan on all that construction over there, and the blocked off streets, and the redirected traffic. So really appreciate all of you coming. Um, so this morning, uh, we're going to have uh, presentations uh, about uh, three, uh, by three really creative and talented filmmakers. Um, and in the case of one of the presentations, because of the level of the visual effects involved, the director, Andrew Wood, will be doing the presentation with the visual effects supervisor, Johnson Thomas, and Andrew and Johnson um, are, or were, I guess, uh, students at SC until last month or something. Um, um, but they're, but this is your thesis film, right? So you're still finishing it. Um, anyway, so the speakers today, and this is the order in which they're going to speak, uh, is Joshua Cal Caldwell. Um, Josh graduated from Fordham, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Ten years ago? Yeah. Um, came right out of the box with an award-winning short film. Um, continued to work, uh, worked his tail off. He's going to be showing some material today that you're going to be surprised at what he was able to achieve um, and uh, some really, really lovely work. Um, he, uh, well, I won't get into the details about the film. As soon as I do, I'm going to start revealing the things you don't want me to talk about. Um, and then Andrew and Johnson uh, created a film called When Pigs Fly. Uh, it's a fantasy film and um, has uh, some CG characters in it and there's some real challenges in how these CG characters were depicted. Um, and, but the other challenge was getting the film made and that's one of the major reasons we're here is how do you get these things done? Because thesis films at USC, students are pretty much on their own. It's just we let the students use the facilities and support them as best we can. But the funding and the, s the production team all comes from the student. Um, uh, and last speaker is Sam Wickert. Uh, Sam's a student presently at Chapman, but we're trying to get him to move, but it probably won't. Um, likes it in Orange County, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, and Sam's doing some amazing stuff on the web. So you'll be seeing what he's doing and his challenge is what he's going through. It is right now the, a period of time that is the richest time for anyone wanting to create media in almost any form 
in history. I can't think of a time when there were more opportunities. Uh, you know, you go back to the Renaissance, if you weren't a fresco painter, you probably couldn't get much work. Um, and it and stayed, you know, when I was a kid, there were three television networks, and there were six motion picture studios, and there were some ind independents out there, uh, and some smaller TV operations, but very little. That was it. There was nothing else. I mean, now there's, you don't have enough fingers and toes in this whole room to count the, the options you have for getting your media out. So you're going to hear a bit about that today. So that's it. So what we're going to do is we'll start with the first presenter, who's Joshua. Uh, and um, at the end of his presentation, I'll get up and introduce the next, which will be Andrew and Johnson, and then Sam will come up last. Um, and then we're all going to sit here uh, and, and do questions and answers. Actually, I'll just help out with questions. I am not going to be answering questions because I'm not the guy who's doing this stuff. So anyway, again, thank you very, very much. And um, just real quickly, to extend the thank you um, that Tony expressed to the people who helped put this together today, uh, I'm just going to name some folks. There's, uh, you, most of you don't know who these people are. So, and that's too bad because they're really great. But, uh, and if you get to meet them, terrific. Um, Claudia Gonzalez, Jonathan Martafel, Andrew Least, Stan Jaros, and Fernando Robello. Fernando's here today, Andrew's back there, Stan's up in the booth. Uh, Jonathan um, is not here today, but worked his tail off getting stuff together. Claudia manages all the facilities here. Um, and those are the people who made the days possible. So my thanks to them. Okay, here we go. All right, uh, I'll hold it. So um, first of all, thank you to USC and to the Visual Effects Society for having me. Um, it's kind of ironic since the film I'm talking about doesn't have a single visual effect in it. Um, but that's okay, since we're talking about a different thing. I thought I'd just start off and, uh, and show my reel and sort of give you a sense of the work that I've been doing over the last 10 years. And uh, then we'll dive into my film layover. It's important that you know why this is happening to you, because if you don't, the rest of the world won't either. Dig. You're going to shoot me anyway. Why should I dig? Dad, I just want to stay here forever, you know? Just freeze this. I just want you and me forever. This is, this is real. In less than an hour, they in will catch up to you and open fire in seconds. So if I were you, I would swing that tool as fast as I can. Un deuxième casque. D'accord. Tu dois t'emballer pas mal de gonzesses avec ta bécane. Pourquoi tu crois que j'ai un deuxième casque? Wist du bisschen warum ich dich töten werde? Does it matter? I don't give a fuck whether you care or not, do you understand me? You don't get to decide what's important and what's not important. I've helped many people to hate the war. Why would your family stand out? You shot my baby sister to the head! It went through my mother! How can I justify it? How can you? Wait. 
You drag me out here, you kick me, you beat me, you order me to dig, and you dare to ask me, how can I justify it? Killing me won't solve your problems. You're wrong. Then why haven't you done it? So, um, I like to kind of give an idea of where I am now um, because it ends up tying all back to layover and the importance of that we'll get to in a minute. Um, so I recently, um, the biggest thing was I recently signed with CAA for representation. Uh, in June I had my second feature film released theatrically through Paramount. I did a series for Hulu um, which was like I directed all six episodes um, which premiered last year and I'm finishing work on my third feature which I had sold prior to uh, making it so even though it was made for a, a smaller budget than normal um, I was still able to work through a distribution company and get it sold before I had even made it and um, that all kind of like for me, that's important to sort of get out there, not to brag, um, but to show in the course of three years what came out of making layover. Um, because so many people trying to, uh, you know, make it in this business, so many people trying to become directors, become writers, whatever, it's always, I don't know how to do it. Because one of the, or how do you do it? Because the biggest um, thing about it is there's no one path. There's no corporate ladder that you can climb, um, you know, there's no like set path to becoming a director, becoming a writer, becoming whatever, really it's getting out there and doing it. And one of the biggest hindrances to doing it is often money and often um, what people think you need to make a film and the type of film that you have to go out and make and you know, how that's gonna then translate into you getting more work and more jobs. And so before I dive too far into that, I wanna show you the trailer to Layover. Um, which was my first feature film. And um, after that, I'll sort of talk a little bit more about it and how we made it. Comment se fait-il que tu aies laissé mon poignet Disons que je suis juste de passage. Je pas une copine à elle. Ah, si. Euh, ouais, elle voulait être actrice. Ah bah tiens, ma parfait, tu devrais l'appeler. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, ça fait des lustres, c'est moi. Je peux te raccompagner sinon T'as un deuxième casque C'est bien. Tu dois t'emballer pas mal de gonzesses avec la bécane. Pourquoi tu crois que j'ai un deuxième casque So, like I said, this movie very directly got me the job directing the series for Hulu, the second feature that Paramount did, and then the third feature, which I sold. Um, anyone want to guess the budget? Uh, 
Thousand? Okay. Anybody else? Twenty-five thousand. Anybody else? You made it for six thousand dollars. Um, and real six thousand. And we arrived at that number because that's what we could get. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, like I like Mike said, I graduated from Fordham. Right out of, out of college, I won an MTV Movie Award. They had this, like, fun student category for a couple years. And um, so I was the recipient of that. Got a golden popcorn, got to give a speech. Um, came out to L.A. and was like, I've got it made. Like, I'm going to be making a feature next year. I'm 22 years old. This is awesome. And then you kind of find out that nobody in the industry watches the MTV Movie Awards. Um, and the uh, PR or the press release conveniently left my category off when it went out to all the trades. Um, so it was a great lesson at a great time, which was this idea that nobody is going to help you. I mean, people are going to help you, but if it's going to happen, it's going to happen because you're going to make it happen. Nobody's going to carry you along. Nobody's going to sort of, you know, help make it happen for you. It really comes down to you and you wanting it. And so I spent a lot of time, a number of years, uh, you know, making shorts and making music videos. I worked as an executive for the creator of CSI, Anthony Zyker, and got very exposed to the digital world and television and, and had that experience for three years. And then I was at this place where I was like, I want, it's time for me to make a feature. Like, I, I, I think that I'm turning 30. Um, my wife's pregnant. It's like, if something's going to happen, then I got to make it happen now. And over the course of the years, I'd gone from, oh, I can probably get one five you know, to make my first thing, 1.5 million. And then it goes, oh, maybe half a million, oh, maybe 250. And it just keeps dropping down as we try to, f my writing partner and I tried to figure out projects that we could do for that amount. And I got to this place where I said, I think I just want to make it. And I, I started, a couple things happened. One, I was experimenting with the 5D um, and the ability to shoot with very little sort of lighting using kind of what's there, um, natural artificial light, if you will. And I also um, read a couple articles. I read an article by uh, Ed Burns, who talked about making movies on the 5D for like 10 grand. And I saw a movie called For Lovers Only by the Polish Brothers, which was um, made on the 5D in Paris for like 10 grand. And I was like, well, I could probably get 10 grand together. Um, I can only get six. But, uh, you know, it was, it was one of those things where we, we said 10, we got six, and we said, great, like, let's go make it. And so... What that meant was, you know, we paid our actors, we paid for food, we paid for some locations, but that, what that meant was we had to be really, really scrappy with everything, and we had to basically cheat and lie and steal whatever we could. So nothing was permitted. But what I didn't want that to do was stop me from making a movie that had a lot of scope. You know, I think traditionally you think you have a low budget, well, then you got to do two people in one location because you got to have this huge crew. And I said, well, I don't know if the huge crew is really necessary because I've only had a huge crew a couple times, but I've done a bunch of other projects where it was just me and a couple other guys. And so actors can do their own makeup. We'll pick out the wardrobe ahead of time. We'll just bring it. Like, you know, we're going to put it up like a china ball or two, so we don't need a huge gaffing crew. We don't need tons of trucks. We don't need any of this. this the, we can use the 5D and pump up the ISO and, and use the light that's available to us. Um, and what we really, but what I really wanted to do was like sort of flip the script of that, which was I wanted to have tons of locations. I wanted to be everywhere. I never wanted to feel like we didn't have any money. I wanted to feel like we had $250,000 or more. And so to me, that always was like the variety of locations, this type of locations. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what we did was we had so little money that we just basically said we had no money. We went back to the days when we were in high school and you just kind of went out and shot and you know, there was two people standing around, so if cops drove by, nobody knew what you were doing. They had no idea that you were making a movie. The public's understanding of making a movie is not a guy standing there with a, a photography camera. Um, and so, you know, we didn't want it to stop us, and one of, the, one of the main ways we didn't want it to stop us was in our locations. And so I'm going to show you the opening of the movie, um, which you kind of saw in the trailer, but it gives you an idea of sort of the scope of it. Gentlemen, as we start our DC, please make sure your seat bags and tray tables are in their 
to the flight position. Make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened and all carry-on luggage is stored underneath the seat in front of you or in the overhead bin. Please turn off all electronic devices which is the safety part of the gate. Thank you. Mesdames et messieurs, nous commençons notre descente. Veuillez regagner vos sièges et vous assurer de lâcher votre ceinture. On se verra dresser vos sièges en position initiale. Nous vous rappelons que tous vos bagages à main sont être mis dans les compartiments de into the room so anybody confronted by the script is going to go how are we pulling this off for six grand like that seems like what are we going to do we're going to do vfx are we going to go find an airplane set and i go no we're going to buy two tickets to san francisco for 250 dollars, and i'm going to fly there with the actress and fly back and we'll shoot everything along the way and that's what we did so we were on a united flight um, we went to the, you know, we had scenes at the end of the movie that take place in the airport during the day and we have stuff at night. And we went to the airport early and we spent the whole day on planes and airports just shooting and just grabbing stuff. Um, and nobody ever stopped us. Nobody ever asked us what we were doing. Um, we were making a movie. They assumed we were taking photographs, which nobody really cared about. And you'll sort of notice that, and one of the things that we were able to do this because I designed it to be captured in that way. I wrote a three minute sequence that has no dialogue, that doesn't require any repeated takes, that doesn't require, it's just a montage. Um, it's not like a fast paced montage, but it's just a montage of images, but you get the story, you understand, and, and information is conveyed. We used voiceover to tell you that she's coming from Paris or it's a Paris based flight, what time it is, where they are. Um, you know, you see her going to, you know, get on the thing, she go to a hotel. In the scene that follows this, you get, a full understanding of everything that just happened. You find out she missed her flight, or she not her, her, her connecting flight was canceled, so she's stuck in a hotel room for the night. So you get all that in the scene that immediately follows this. Um, and so this was a big example of like, also too, in, in kind of playing with audiences' expectations. Like, yeah, let's start on a plane over Los Angeles, and nobody's gonna guess that this was made for like $6,000. Um, and so that was, you know, we wrote a movie 
that could be accomplished that we actually went back to to not only is it in French but we went back to the idea of the French new wave which was if you watch those movies you see all the mo all the scenes where they have a, like controlled dialogue scenes they're all indoors they're all in places they could control and they could light and they could you know sort of have have that that control that they needed to do multiple takes and get performance and get all that stuff uh, we did the same thing. So all the dialogue scenes happened in places that we had control over or knew nobody was around. So we weren't trying to control extras or corral anybody or anything like that. And then we did tons of scenes with, uh, you know, in clubs, on motorcycles, um, you know, walking around downtown L.A. where we would, if we wanted to do a dialogue scene, we'd mic them with labs and we'd get whatever we could, um, you know, or if we or we just let it kind of turn into montage. And as a result, the movie feels very expansive and very big. And we're kind of we're all over L.A. I mean, it starts down at the airport, ends up going into Silver Lake, goes downtown, goes up into the Hollywood Hills, um, goes back down to the airport. And so we're all over the place. And um, nobody was really the wiser when we were making it. And the thing is, I think that, that for me, it was interesting because looking at this movie, I was really surprised by the reaction to the budget because I was like, well, there's no VFX in it. And it's not like a thriller and it's not like this thing where you think that, oh yeah, that makes sense. That's really a wow thing that it was made for so little money. But for some reason, the movie, the budget became a big talking point. We premiered up at Seattle. Um, the Seattle International Film Festival. We were part of their Catalyst program, and we got nominated for one of their awards up there, and, and it became a big focal point of making, uh, you know, and I was like, oh, we made a drama. Nobody's going to care that we made it for six grand. Like, that's not that impressive, at least I don't think. Um, I thought people were going to be impressed that ha being a non-French speaker, I made it in French. Um, <laughs> nobody just seemed to really care. Um, it's, it's always the third thing they ask. Um, and But it was, you know, and so I... I kind of had this idea in my head of a layover and I thought, well, that could be something we could do because I can shoot at night in LA, I can use the 5D and open it up and really see the world. Um, and I just have to design a story that allows me to capture it for no, no money. And you know, a lot of that is a lot of walking around. It's like in places we could like, whatever we could get, like we'd reach out and we say, hey, we, wanna, we, we know we're gonna have a scene that's like a house party. What we're not gonna do is write a scene that's like this rager where there's like, we know that there's tons of kids and if there aren't tons of kids that don't, if we don't get tons of extras, then it's going to feel like an empty thing. We wrote it as a deliberately small thing. So that way, we, if we got 12 people, we kind of in the dialogue, we had them say, yeah, it's this like weird after party thing. I don't know. I, I don't really know anybody here. You know, it's, and so we used the dialogue to convey the idea of what you were seeing. So it wasn't like, let's go to this huge raging house party in the hills. And then you get there and there's 12 people or you're trying to shuffle people around and hide extras, you know? Um, we kind of, we, we were very sparse about it. We didn't write in too many details. We didn't specify that this location had to be this because that allowed us to find any location that we could get, preferably the cheap one. Um, you know, there's a club scene with no dialogue in it, or there's one bit of dialogue which we ADR'd, but there's some action. And we just went to a, uh, through a connection, we went to a club and said, hey, can we come in with our camera? We won't close it off. We won't see any of the extras. We just want to come in and get a bunch of footage. They're like, yeah, sure. So we did that. I was prepared to buy a bottle and get table service and shoot it on an iPhone. But that was the spirit of, of making the movie, which was like whatever it took to sort of get it done. But it was written loose enough that we were able to make use of whatever we could get. You know, So like I rode in a motorcycle, which I owned, and I was the rider in it. Um, you know, We rode in... A hotel because we knew we could get a hotel anywhere we knew we could just go rent a hotel somewhere um and shoot in it and have nobody know and and again nobody nobody ever knew what we were doing um and so it was it was a process of in you know i can answer more in the q a as you guys sort of simmer with that budget level and all that stuff um but it was a it was mainly the thing was i think you think oh i've got to write this like i've got to come up with this like commercial thing i've got to do this and i'm going to do that and the fact is, like, you don't necessarily need to do it. I, I made a movie. My first feature was a French language indie drama with no stars. <laughs> it, I almost made it in black and white, and we thought that might be one step too far. Um, <laughs> and listen, it, it recently got distribution. It's on iTunes. You know, Universal did not pick it up. It wasn't like some big sale. It didn't play at Sundance. It didn't even play at, like, it played at Seattle, and that was its major premiere, and that was it. It played at a couple other festivals, but it wasn't some big thing. But we'd made it for so little, and we got friends to sort of write about it and create attention about it on No Film School and Slash Film and all that stuff. 
And so as a result, like people became very interested in it. And like I said, the last three projects I've done came as a direct result of having done this. So it didn't get distribution. It didn't turn anything, but people in the industry saw it and loved it because everybody in the industry loves foreign films um, and loves indie dramas, even if they don't think they can sell it, but they want to then make use. They want to say, well, I love this movie. Let's do something let's do something together and so the hulu series came out because i directed this with very no known actors and for some reason the producer was impressed that like actors that weren't brad pitt could actually give a performance um you know uh be somebody came out because it was the similar style and a similar kind of indie thing the uh negative which is the latest movie was a result of an exec seeing it and loving it and saying we'd love to find something to do together so you know it's that kind of thing where what I think people really loved about it was it's this sweet little story. It's got a very personal uh, vision, and they're impressed by the fact that I was able to do it for very little money, which you know, kind of to execs is always like, oh great, we can give them. We don't have to give them as much as the other guy. Um, the main thing that I say is that you know this came about. F this came after 15 years of do-it-yourself filmmaking, of trying things, failing working with the 5D on shorts and little things and saying, yeah, this looks, I can make use of the city lights. I don't have to come in here and light. I can spend, uh, you know, 20 minutes setting up a China ball and then I can spend eight hours shooting takes, which gives me better performance and gives me more time with the actors and better story. Because at the end of the day, um, that's what people care about. That's what I found in screening layover that what people really gravitate towards is the story and the characters. And they don't care that there's some noise in the image because I shot at 6400 ISO. They don't care that the camera's a little handheld because that's all I had. They don't care, you know, they don't care that it's a little rough looking because we were able to do a really great sound mix, which evened out all those bumps. And so, um, but it was something that we went into saying, we want to make this, we want to make something for the money we have, but we don't want that to stop us in terms of the scope and the scale of the story. And so Layover was sort of born of that. Um, and it served me in ways moving forward to say, well, I know how to do this. I know how we could do this for cheap. I know how to cheat this. No, we don't need permits for this stuff. Let's just go in and do it. Um, and we'll see how long that lasts until Universal says, well, we actually need to get permits. So let's give you some extra money. And uh, that's it. So if you guys have any questions, we could talk at the Q&A, and I'll pass it along to the next uh, presentation. Thank you, Joshua. <clears throat> Hold on a second here. Can I still put on? Okay, next, um, Andrew Wood, and uh, will come up and speak and introduce Johnson, Thomason, and talk about when pigs fly. Thank you. So I'm Andrew Wood. I'm the writer and director of When Pigs Fly, and um, thank you for having me here. Um, when Mike emailed me about talking this, I wanted to have Johnson up here, um, just because technically I don't know what I'm talking about with the VFX, but also because of the amount of hours and creative contribution, it's as much his film as mine at this point. That's heartwarming. That's great. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, When Pigs Fly is a comedy about a boy that discovers a magic tree that can bring all his drawings to life. Um, things don't work out great, um, so as a result, he grows up to be a drunk uncle and later retells the story to his niece. So it's a frame story with past and present, kind of like Princess Bride in structure, um, but shorter. So why pigs? Uh, I didn't... Sorry. I didn't get into film because of Lawrence or Arabia or Some Like It Hot, as great as those movies are. I got into film after seeing the Nightcrawler sequence that began X-Men 2, um, with it popping around when they're trying to assassinate the president because it was just something I'd never seen before and didn't know it was possible. So that's what kind of makes movies magic to me, um, is creating something that doesn't exist and making it real and tangible, and what we hope to accomplish with One Pig's Fly. Uh, when? Uh, so we have a professor here called Bruce Block who teaches a class in our second semester uh, about visual expression and at the end of it he kind of gives this very impassioned speech about finding something that makes you unique as a filmmaker. Kind of nobody's going to hire you to do what Michael Bay can do because he can already do it and do it better than you. You have to find something that makes you unique and it wasn't like a 
rah-rah speech, you're a oh, unique butterfly, everything's going to be great. It was kind of figure out something you can do that other people can't or stay forever in your cocoon of loneliness. Um, so I was a fine artist. Um, that's my background. This is a picture of my grandma. So uh, it's pencil. So like I wanted to kind of uh, find a way to combine art and film to kind of make certain characters look like living drawings like that. Um, so I started off as a illustrator doing wildly unpopular children dark comedies um, before coming to USC. Um, so this is the initial test uh, we did, um, or I did by hand. There's a little bit of shoe leather, but... So that drawing took about 30 hours um, for one frame. So at 24 frames a second, we kind of did the math and figured out it would take a year to animate 12 seconds at that pace. Um, but luckily, I had work start study and was sitting next to Johnson. And he kind of leaned over and saw what I was doing and said, like, hey, there's these things called computers that might be able to help. Um, <laughs> So once we figured out it was, in theory, possible to do it, we had to find money. Um, so largely because of Professor Fink's misplaced faith in me as a filmmaker, um, we received a fellowship from Fox for student wor students wanting to work in VFX for 20000 um, But it still kind of wasn't enough for everything we wanted to do, so we launched a Kickstarter. Um, kind of with what Johnson was doing, um, we're playing this blissfully without audio. Um, what Johnson was doing with VFX, we didn't want it to be put in lipstick on a pig. We wanted the cinematography to be as good as it could be, so we shot on the Alexa in production design with building this 15-foot practical light bulb tree. Um, and just every aspect of produ production had to be up to snuff with the VFX. Um, so that's what we aimed for. And as like an unexpected consequence of making this video and making like a, a two minute pitch that was easy to watch, that had our faces and kind of what we were going for that doesn't really get conveyed in writing, um, we were able to convince Glenn Howard and from Always Sunny to play the lead, who's someone I kind of grew up watching since high school. It was a really cool experience. Um, kind of aside from just pitching the story, we wanted this, Kickstarter video to look as glossy as possible um, without actually spending any money. That's why there's so much, so much movement for no reason. Um, <laughs> just to kind of prove our competency as filmmakers um, that like we were researching Kickstarter videos and there's so many that had bad sound or like there was overexposed windows that kind of, if we couldn't make the Kickstarter video well, we couldn't expect people to give us money. Um, but we did that and we were able to raise uh, about 20,000 um, and get Glenn. So like he, we got the Fox Fellowship in July um, and he was one of the first people we checked for availability and they didn't get back to us just with working actors and famous actors. Um, none of them will uh, commit to an unpaid student film four months in advance. Um, so we tried again three weeks before production and kind of with this video um, and at the time we did, he had a feature to read in our 10 page script and he didn't feel like reading the feature. Um, so we went with our script and like brought us in for a meeting, but we just got lucky in terms of all the gatekeepers that could have potentially like not let us through, like his agent, his manager, Glenn himself, it all just happened at the right time. And he happened to be available because they just wrapped Always Sunny. Um, so that's him. Since then, he's had me on to shadow Always Sunny as a director. So it's like a relationship I have now where I otherwise wouldn't if we had never rolled the dice making this crazy film. Um, so we have a, a brief clip of just Glenn with his co-star. Um, there's not going to be any VFX in this. It's like one, the only minute and a half of the film without VFX. Um, and it's 
production sound before color correction, but you can kind of get the gist of the feel of the film. And then we'll have Johnson come up. Can I have a beer? How old are you? Almost 10. <laughs> are you gonna take care of us now? My mom says you're unemployed. She's... Uh, I'm underemployed. There's a big fucking difference, all right? Not that you would know anything about it. How come my mom doesn't drink? Because your mom is fucking boring. I shouldn't say that. Right? But Tommy, your dad, he didn't drink either. He had his reasons. Dad and I grew up in this house. I've been back here in 25 years. That's about your age when it burned down. How come it burned down? I don't know. Something about water mains. Or... Hey, did you ever get into those Harry Potter books? Mom only lets me read American. She only lets you read American? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay. Wow. Dad took us to see the movies. Yeah, the movies. Not the same thing, but... Cool. And now I'll have Johnson talk more about the VFX. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew, for that kind introduction. I'm Johnson Thomason. Um, I'm honored to be speaking to uh, a room full of VES members. Uh, I hope to be one of you guys one day. Um, last April, uh, Andrew came to me with that drawing uh, that he showed uh, the still frame and he said it took 20 or 30 hours to draw it. And Like he said, I, I went to, to work in my mind on how can we uh, make that more efficient using computers. And um, it was a problem I just couldn't get out of my head. And uh, so later that summer, uh, I committed to, to the project as a visual effects supervisor knowing it was going to take like a year of my time, and it has. Uh, I'm still working on it uh, today, but almost done. Um, in the end, there were uh, 85 visual effects shots. Um, it's seven or eight minutes of the film, um, and uh, three CG characters. Um, these are uh, creatures that the little boy, young Al, young Glenn Howerton, draws, which you'll see in a minute, that have come to life in the real world. Um, we also had to develop this sketch look process. Um, I had some initial thoughts about how to do that, and I'll get into the weeds a little bit, but I'm going to try to keep the focus on the topic of the talk, which is creating your own content. And, um, and also, Andrew, uh, in all his wisdom, wanted to shoot this with these Kawa uh, 1970s anamorphic lenses, which made my life a living hell uh, in post. Um, and also, he wanted to do it all uh, I had $5,000 to do it. Um, the production, uh, as you can tell, uh, is totally worth it, was expensive, um, but it looks great. Um, we had a, a great top-notch crew, and I think we've made a really uh, aesthetically beautiful film, and hopefully the visual effects keep up. <laughs> it's funny, they were trying to have the film live up to the visual effects, and now uh, I'm trying to make my visual effects live up to the film. So. Um, these are just the creatures. I'm going to introduce you to a couple of creatures. This is the flying pig. Um, this uh, sketch on the left is the concept art, but it's also the actual sketch that uh, young Al draws uh, that then uh, comes to life in the film. Um, and that's a, a final rendering um, there of the pig on the right. Uh, this is another creature. The pig is the hero. Uh, he's the, the titular pig that flies. Um, the dragonfly is a side character. Um, this is a, a baby tree that features in two shots at the end of the film, one of the few uh, photorealistic renderings that we uh, attempted, and, um, and I'm pretty pleased with how it came out. Uh, this is just going to be a quick clip that shows some of the final shots. 
these are before color correction. Um, Andrew has a great vision for color, um, and it's already looking great. But this is straight out of Nuke uh, for the most part. Uh, but I wanted to show you just some what it, some of the shots look like. There's no audio. Um, so this is post-sketch look. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, big dragonfly. This is was all handheld on the day, um, which in retrospect was probably not a great decision. Um, with anamorphic lenses, it was difficult to match move, but we got there. I'll talk about that too. Some of these shots are not final like that last one. It's our E.T. homage. Uh, these particles were something that we decided to do after we'd already shot the film. Great decision. There were like 40 of those shots all had to be 3D tracked. Yeah, so that's that. Um, um, so before I jump into this organization, this is the part that I think has the most to do with creating your own content, but uh, since you are VES members, I figure you'll appreciate some of the technical uh, de details about the visual effects work. Um, the sketch look was the first challenge that we, uh, we faced, and um, our initial step was to uh, video Andrew drawing. Um, we wanted to emulate his process as much as possible in the computer. Um, and so I watched him draw, I took video of it, and then I watched it over and over again to try to figure out what he was doing and how I could mimic those steps in the computer. And uh, the first light bulb moment was the use of particles um, to create the sketch texture. Um, so what we did was I had Andrew draw a full page of sketch strokes all moving the same direction and I sampled those as particles and then using a particle system um, I could shoot them out uh, onto the creatures and, um, and they would stick and we would have an ever-evolving um, random assimilation of sketch strokes. Uh, we did some tests about getting the uh, direction of the sketch strokes to uh, flow, um, but in the end you couldn't tell the difference whether they flowed with contour lines or not and it was, it was just too much work for uh, too little return. Um, on the young girl, Gray, uh, that you saw two clips of, then the challenge was how do we get the sketch, stro sketch strokes to stay on her body. Um, we didn't have the resources uh, to do full 3D tracking. Um, that would be uh, a 3D match move as if we had geometry for her. Um, that would have uh, just been impossible, I think, considering our budget. But we came up with a 2.5D approach that used uh, planes um, and tracked points. Uh, we would track, say, cheekbones, uh, between the eyes, chin, so that we would get the uh, deformation when her mouth moved. And surprisingly, it worked really, really well. And it, the texture appeared to stick to her almost perfectly. Um, and then with the CG creatures, of course, that was easier um, because we're rendering them. Um, so that's, that's that. Uh, the particles that you saw with the tree, that was something, a brilliant idea I came up with in post. I was like, you know what would make this more magical? It's if it was just filled with particles. And uh, I think there are 40 shots in that environment. Um, and all had to be match moved and different layers had to be rotoed so that some particles were behind some trees and others were of other trees and that was the challenge. Um, so to pull all of this off uh, under budget um, I put together a small team of students. Um, I did a lot of the compositing work, uh, some of the modeling, some of the texturing, all of the lighting, uh, but I worked with uh, several great animators, ones in the audience, Franklin, uh, who did the pig, um, back there, hey Franklin. Um, he was really great to work with. 
And um, so I wanted to work with USC students. I also wanted to catch uh, people who are at a point in their careers where the project was the reward. Um, we didn't have uh, a lot of money to pay artists. Um, so I needed to convince them that the final product would would be worth their time. And, uh, and I think everyone that joined our team is, uh, doesn't regret it. Um, we also did some outsourcing. The Match Move uh, stuff initially, uh, we outsourced. I used a website called artsjobsconnections.com. I think there's too many S's in that, but artjobsconnection.com. Um, and that's where I, a lot of the big VFX studios post. Some of you may be familiar with that website. Um, so there would be like double negative and digital domain, ILM, USC thesis film. <laughs> I felt a little embarrassed to be posting there, but I got uh, great, um, great artists through that avenue. Um, a great Match Move artist who works at Sony Imageworks during the day and did our, did our Match Move work for us at night. On our budget, um, I just said, here's the number we can afford. And, um, it was worth it to him to do it, so um, pleased with how that worked out. We also um, outsourced the rigging for the creatures. Uh, we worked with an artist in India, a guy in London, um, who I really hit it off with, and we've continued to work on projects since this. Um, we used a modeler out of San Francisco, who at one point worked for LucasArts. Um, so all of this uh, through the miracle of the World Wide Web, um, you have have access to talent around the world. You're not limited to your geographic region. And uh, that was a really exciting thing about this project and, and about projects moving forward. And I think is useful information when you think about creating your own content. Um, the other big uh, challenge we faced in attempting to do a visual effects project of this size was uh, file storage and backup. We shot uh, Airy Raw on the Alexa at uh, basically 3K. And uh, so I think there were eight terabytes of raw footage, um, about two of those, two terabytes worth of visual effects shots, um, all had to be organized and backed up multiple times um, and available for distribution to the artists that were working on them. Um, so someone tipped me off that at USC, uh, we have unlimited Google Drive space on our student accounts. Um, so as of today, I think I have three terabytes of storage on Google Drive that I'm not paying for. Um, and from there, I had uh, perpetual backup. And I had a way to share with my team members only what they needed to have. Um, and we could, uh, we could all see uh, what we were working on in, in real time. And, um, and that worked out really well. Uh, communication was also a big thing. How do we organize a project of this size and communicate and uh, keep up with notes and versions of shots? Um, we used a, a web app called Trello for that. Uh, I'll just jump to that slide. This is what a piece of that looks like. Um, we have our shot numbers at the top. We have the initial plate screenshot. Um, if you uh, dig down into the screenshot, you have a preview of the whole plate. Um, that's streamed over the web. You don't have to have it locally. Thanks to Google Drive, you can just embed the uh, shared file there. We had a color-coded system for um, status of various tasks. Uh, red for not begun, yellow for in progress, green for done. We could have gotten more granular than that, but it was a lot to keep up with when I was the only one keeping up with it. Um, and we could assign tasks from here. You see Franklin's lovely mug there on the pig animation. Um, he would get an email when I assigned it to him, and, um, and we could also embed links to the Maya project files that were ac accessible straight from here through Google Drive. Um, so Trello and Google Drive working hand in hand was a great tool for um, managing this large scale project uh, with a small team, small distributed team. Um, most of the time we were working remotely, um, chatting, calling, emailing. Uh, preferably, we would have been communicating on here, and we did that some, um, but we communicated through all different channels. Uh, what ended up being a great tool for us, for our USC team, was getting together in the labs and working together, um, which is why visual effects studios exist and have brick-and-mortar locations, uh, because you can just 
work more quick, quickly when you're all in the same space. Um, so that was great. We would have work days. We'd say, okay, we're going to get to the lab at 10 a.m. on Saturday, and we're going to work till the lab closes at midnight. And uh, that's how it was the last couple weeks before the end of the semester. And we got a lot done in a short period of time that way. It was pretty cool. Um, oh, and lastly, I'm glad I didn't skip this. Uh, I wanted to talk about rendering. Um, we emulated as best we could a uh, feature film pipeline on this. Um, from the Airy RAW files, we, we exported trims in 32-bit EXR, only the frames that we needed, and worked at 32-bit in Nuke all the way through. Um, we had proxy JPEGs uh, for uh, faster playback when we needed it. Um, and in the end, all the, the 3D renders needed to be done. And I've got a, a pretty beefed up desktop at home, but it just wasn't enough to keep up with the amount of uh, output I needed it to do. Um, and so what I did was I used render farms over the web. I'm sure lots of you are fam familiar with these online render farms. Uh, I tried three or four of them. I ended up with going with one called The Ranch. It's in France. And they had a student discount, which was 50% off. Um, and so uh, I think we spent $400 rendering, um, 20 shots, uh, say uh, three minutes of CG, which is a lot of frames and multiple versions, all EXRs with uh, multiple channels. I think we had 10 to 12 channels in these EXRs, so each frame is like 100 megabytes. Um, we were able to render that in France, download the files within 15 minutes sometimes, uh, and uh, that worked out really, really well for us. It enabled us to sort of exceed our grasp in a way, which is what we were trying to do all along with this project, was go bigger than we thought possible with our little budget and our little team. and. Uh, uh, I'm really proud of uh, our team and what we have come up with. And the film will be finished in uh, a number of weeks, screening in August. So I'm excited. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Johnson. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, next and last, uh, Sam Wickert. Sam's a young student from Chapman College. And... Uh, He's got some very cool stuff to show you, so here it is. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Sam Wickert. Uh, as you see, I'm on the, the right of that photo. Uh, that's my partner, Eric. We met in fifth grade, uh, and we started making YouTube videos, and we still, not, not much has changed. Uh, but yeah, I run a YouTube channel, and you know, I was really inspired by the content I watched on YouTube when I was younger. Uh, it, it's the reason why I'm here today, and it's the reason why I create content. Uh, and I'm just going to share with you a little bit of the stuff we do uh, so you can get a better understanding and then I can go from there. So here's a little channel trailer that we have that we feature on our YouTube platform. Three, two, one, go! So that's just uh, a little a little taste of what we offer on our YouTube page. We you know, we we try to make a lot of just fun content. It's geared towards you know visual effects imagery. We use that to really tell fun stories and you know, hopefully make people smile. Uh, that's the that's the new goal here. Uh, but as you can see, you know we've got this is one of our 
fun videos we made in the past few months, it's Mousetrap. And uh, what if we had a real life cursor, me and Eric are running around just causing you know, chaos, copying, pasting each other, uh, right click on the shirt, personalize, change the color. Uh, and we, we ran around with this clone for the rest of the video. Uh, you know, and emoji faces. Uh, it's funny, we actually made this video a few weeks ago, uh, right before Snapchat announced their new augmented reality feature. And we included this in and we kind of predicted the future. In a way, I, I think Snapchat actually copied our video. But, <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, but it did, it did receive some press from that, so it was fun. But, uh, you know, we, we've been running the channel for a while. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm, from Ch I'm at Chapman University and I'm a sophomore, going into my sophomore year. And we kind of ran the channel intermittently through high school, me and Eric. And really the biggest piece of content we created that you know, has brought our channel to where it's at today is a little series we created called Chalk Warfare. And you saw it a bit in that channel trailer. Uh, collectively, there's three that make up the series and they've been viewed a total over 30 million times, all three. And it's something that we you know, plan to continue and it's just a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I can talk about it, but again, I'm just gonna go ahead and show you. It's, a lot of our content is a lot shorter. Uh, so this next clip, this is Chalk Warfare 3. So this is the last one we created. Uh, a uh, couple years ago, uh, so enjoy. And it was a little laggy like next or last time, so I'm gonna go ahead and get out of this and actually just play it from the computer itself. <laughs> 